Hi, everyone. This is Catching Up with the Nerds with your hosts, Tom and JC, and our special guest, David. Uh, this is a podcast about two dads that are catching up with all the nerdy stuff we missed, sharing how we pass on our nerdy passions to our kids and deep diving into nerd pop culture to make it more accessible for you. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Hello. How are doing? All, right. all good. All good. All good. Nice, fellas. <laughs> so, thanks for joining us again this weekend. And uh, should we do a quick round of interest? Uh, as always, our special guest, David, you want to take, do the honors? Sure. My name is David Sago. I am founder and host, uh, along with Tom, of the Grit and Grind Basketball podcast. Um, I am a producer mostly. Um, I do some teaching as well. Um, and I am into nerd culture, um, mostly gaming. I uh, was a big Nintendo guy for a long time. Uh, what to Mr. Buckner? Is his name Mr. Buckner? Our YouTube sure. fan. <laughs> um, a big, yeah, a big Nintendo guy for many years, and then I bought a PS4, and I'm never going back. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Even sad. for Animal Crossing, come on now. <laughs> uh, Metroid. Me- Metroid is the one that will get me to to look over at the green grass. Um, <laughs> But I have also dabbled in anime. Um, I'm big into mythology. Um, and I, what's the other stuff I like? Uh, cartoons. I like cartoons. Been, been known to dabble in WandaVision, I've heard. Ah, here and there, but you know, I'm not really a big Marvel guy. <laughs> not anymore. That's all what happened. Not anymore. Betrayed. <laughs> Betrayed. Ooh. By ourselves. Right, I'll go next. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Tom. I'm still 50% of the Catching Up With The Nerd uh, podcast. And I'm, what, 25% of the, uh, yeah, Green and Grind like podcast? That. something. I, I'm not good with numbers. Yeah, 30%. Oh, no, no cool. less than that. 22. Oh, 22, <laughs> bloody hell. Numbers. Um, I am still married to my lovely wife, Ellie. We still have two kids, one who is four, <laughs> named Louis. And the other one is who is 11, and she's called Emily. Uh, they've been listening to every single podcast we've released so far. I'm massively into video games, and I, well, I wasn't a Nintendo fanboy. I'm more of a Sega, you know. Mm. Uh, Sega. <laughs> yeah, the, the better. Sega. And Sega. Uh, um, <laughs> currently playing, spending my days working, allegedly, and uh, playing PlayStation 5. Um, what else am I into? I'm into Dragon Ball massively. If you followed my well, our Instagram page, to which you should subscribe, you've seen a bunch of um, Dragon Ball stuff happening there. Um, I love everything that's nerdy, so I, I don't want to put myself into a box, into a corner. You know, if it's nerdy, I like it. That's it. Over to you, JC. Nice. I am Juan Carlos Garay. Everybody calls me JC. Uh, Originally from Honduras. uh, Got to Portland where I live today via London where I met Tom. And uh, I am 50% of the podcast, but today I've been reduced down to 33 to make room for a special day. But uh, I too, uh, as like Tom said, I'm still married, which leads me to believe that you wake up every day and are surprised at that, as I am, yes. as am I, that I am still married to, to my wife, that she has not disowned me over my nerdiness. Uh, my lovely wife, Fiorella, and my two lovely kids, uh, Aiden, who's my 11-year-old, and my soon-to-be six-year-old, Arabelle. She's got a birthday coming up. Uh, and I love all things graphic novels, novels of sci-fi, fantasy, uh, I love my nerdy shows and movies, uh, but I also have dabbled in video games. And I think I've never shared this. I also backed to Sega train and lived mm-hmm. to, to somewhat regret it at one point. Oh. <laughs> but for a, t- for a time, I felt like the cool kid for a very short time. <laughs> All the cool kids are Sega. All of the cool yeah. kids. Except when you can't swap games with anyone. And that really sucked mm. <laughs> because I was the only one that had a Sega. Really? Oh, that sucks. Yeah, it kind of sucked. Hmm. Um, I play California games way too much on the same oh, console. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Way oh, yeah. too much. That's Trying to figure out the hacky sack one. Could never do that one well. No one did. Uh, <laughs> I think Anyways. two of them were good and the rest were unplayable. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. I, I kept trying to do the surfing one. Kept desperately trying oh, to play that game. One sucked. It was so bad. And I kept trying to go, look, I can kind of jump. And that was it. That one trick I could do in that game. Anyways, uh, <laughs> we are back and talking yep. about Afrofuturism. 
So this is the fifth part, I want to say, in our Black yes. History Month series. Yep. Uh, so definitely, if you haven't checked the previous one, go back and check those out. But to enjoy today's episode, you do not have to have listened to those episodes uh, as we basically went through a series of recommendations of mm -hmm. like, whether it be Black protagonists, Black creators, Black directors, Black filmmakers, whatever it be, just trying to promote uh, all the creators that we loved over the years that happened to be Black, but at the same time that we want to make sure we celebrate their art going forward, yeah. right? Um, and that's what we have for Black, for Black History Month. Uh, we have spilled into March, but we're going to continue on theme, uh, looking at a topic that we've all been looking forward to, which is Afrofuturism. And for there's a lot of people out there who don't know what that is. Tune in today to find out. This is part of our like intro to nerd culture. This is one of elements of summer culture that we love, and we want to make sure you guys get to know it and get to dive and get geek, dive into it and get geeky about it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm really I'm actually quite very much interested in topics. This well, actually, you're the one who introduced me into into the the term the word Afrofuturism because I was like, okay, that's interesting because I had no concept of what it was up until you brought it up. Um, so I'm genuinely interested in understanding and knowing what it is and where it came from and where it's going. So, um, yeah, it's going to be, we'll have a few questions, I guess. And, uh, if you, you know, we'll, we'll jump on, uh, whatever you have to say and, uh, trying to divert you from, uh, getting to the end of your, of your entire list. That's what we're here for today, but we want to learn, maybe <laughs> we want to learn. So bring it on. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. So before we kick off, actually, I'd love to know from you guys, what's your impression of Afro Futurism at this point? Like, what, what do you guys feel that it is as I kind of dive into some of the definitions around it? Oof. Dave? <laughs> initial th initial um, thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's basically just um, Afro, African, uh, Pan-African influenced um, modern culture, modern and future culture. There is um, a set of clothes, a set of uh, ideas, um, a set of, it's just basically a culture that embraces what African culture would look like in the near future, essentially. Yep. So, yep, that, that's, that's not far off, dude. Uh, what be Tom, any initial thoughts you had about it? No, I literally. So the the first thing that came to mind when you when you used that term when you when you introduced that to me was um, obviously Black Panther, um, yeah. which is you know it's it's it it kind of combines um, African culture with what is basically those two words together. It's like it's literally I, that's the one thing I, I pictured. So again, completely new to the concept. Um, so. My, my first reaction was, oh, okay, so is he talking about Black Panther? I'm sure there must be more, more to it. Um, it's an interesting... Um, the reason why I find it interesting is, is because for years, and especially growing up, like the only thing you would associate Africa with or anything that is um, related to African culture is always you see third world countries, you see things that are like, you know, on the news, it's like the first thing you see is poor people. People don't have access to... Um, food, water, healthcare, um, even entertainment, on the same level that we do in, you know, let's say in Europe, in America. Yeah. So it's quite it's quite interesting that it's not something that is like we ourselves are brought up with that notion that you know anything that is related to that continent um, doesn't really forward itself into the future. If you know what I mean, no, it doesn't it doesn't yeah. scream mo modernism. That's the word I'm looking for. And I think that's what that's what that's, that, that topic jumped to me. And I was like, oh, actually, that's that's an interesting concept. It's something that I really want to look look into. Yeah. Um, so th that's that's why to me it's, it's sort of these two things that again, growing up, were never really put together. Those two words, Africa or African culture and futurism, technology, um, in, in of innovation, also. So it's it's quite. And you know, I'm 100 sure <laughs> so that's not the truth. There's a lot of things going on in Africa that, for X, Y, Z reasons, we fail to discuss, at least in the media. But yeah, that's that's so, my yeah, yeah. Yeah. so th that's what I want to kind of ask you guys because there's it's just such a broad topic. 
is the reality that matters. Like mm-hmm. what you guys both said is, is spot on in different ways, yep. right? And so let me read you guys quickly the, the, the definition I found on Wikipedia about it. So Afrofuturism is defined as a cultural aesthetic, a philosophy of science, a philosophy of history that explores a developing intersection of the African diaspora culture with technology. Right. So some places where you might have seen it, it could be, for example, like you just mentioned right now, it could be clothes, it could be music, it could be a novel, it could be a graphic novel, it could be a series, it could be a movie. There's all these things. So Afrofuturism in itself is not a medium. It's not like, oh, this is what it, it is a philosophy. It is a, a vision. It is like a way of approaching our known mediums, books, uh, movies, series, uh, all this sort of stuff through a different lens. And that, that's where it gets interesting, right? It's, it's to, to, what, to, to David's point, it is very much a, um, a state, right? It, it is like a way of seeing things differently. But to your point, Tom, as well, it also has to do a lot with technology and our perceptions of technology that are not rooted in Western technology as well, which is also a very big point about futurism. It's like what we consider advanced technology is not what is considered advanced technology in Africa. And that's not that one is more advanced than the other. It's just different ways the technology has progressed because of what the way that life has been in Africa versus other countries, because of the way that displaced African bodies have had to make their way throughout the rest of the world, right? Um, so that that's very much at the, kind of the heart of it. Uh, so let me talk to you guys a little bit more in terms of like the background of Afrofuturism. Because there's something interesting here to discuss in that Afrofuturism is actually a term that's being retrospectively added to a lot of culture. So there's things that happened that at the time were not considered Afrofuturism, but once the term was coined, people have looked back at those at those moments, whether it be in music, film, uh, uh, books, literature, mm-hmm. and then said, oh, that was Afrofuturism. Like we just didn't know it at the time. Right, we couldn't we couldn't give it that name, so the term first gets coined in 1994. Once again, ironically, by a guy named Mark Derry, who's white, uh, but writes an essay called "Black to the Future," uh, where he points out that there's just a lack of black writers and black stories in science fiction. And one of the quotes from that essay is, "Can a community whose past has been deliberately rubbed out imagine a possible future?" Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that in itself is a very important term in Afrofuturism futurism because it, it comes in terms of the notion of pasts that have been removed and is in the form of displaced African bodies that were brought to them, whether it be the US or Europe or other Asian countries for labor who lost their past. They had no lineage at that point, right? That they could uh, call upon because they didn't know where their ancestors had come from because their grandparents had been brought over from a different country. So how can you imagine a future when you, ha- when you struggle so much to, to recollect what's in your past, right? And he kind of mm-hmm. starts with that term. And there's things that, are, that I'm in agreement, not agreeing with those, with that, with mm-hmm. that statement, but mm-hmm. there's, it's definitely an interesting notion, right? Of, of looking at it objectively. Yeah, I think uh, like the first thing that popped out to me as a point to disagree on is Mm -hmm. having their pasts rubbed out because as is often the case when you speak about Africa from a American standpoint uh, or from a a European standpoint or however the people were displaced, um, you forget that Africa is Africans who are in Africa and their past wasn't rubbed out. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, like they they have family members that are still um, feeling the um, positives and negatives of colonialism and, and all that has gone before with the French Empire and the British Empire and um, everyone that's invaded Africa over the years. Right? They know it's there. <laughs> their their history is there, and they know what it is. Um, and funnily enough, although it was coined in America a lot of the um, Afrofuturism concept and contents actually come out of Africa rather than um, being made uh, abroad. 
And, and that, that is absolutely spot on, dude, because that's where there's actually a very active debate right now around what Afrofuturism means. Because to your point, mm-hmm. it, it very much has been looked at through the Western lens mm-hmm. and not through the African lens. And that's really the, 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 the biggest lens upon it should be the African lens. Uh, and that's why when you look at when you hear this, it very much sounds like someone that is connect. There's trying to connect with the African-American experience, but not with the African experience mm-hmm. necessarily. Right. Because th- th- there's a big difference there. So that's one of the things that I wanted to bring up that, that quote, because even though that's how it, it originally quoted, I still feel there's something not quite right with how it was initially coined. Yeah. There's a bit of a disconnect there because it's not, it's not um, Africans who's, you know, like, like Dave says, it's not being rubbed out. I mean, they're, they're still, they were there before, um, you know, for example, like slavery and, and stuff like that. And then they're still here now. And so the story continued, but it's just, it's been altered. I think is the word. Yeah. Um, but it's been rubbed out, yeah, from an African American's perspective, yeah, sure, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, because then after that, we get someone called Alondra Nelson, who was considered in the '90s one of the most influential women in tech. Funny enough, um, and she's black, and she got very interested in the in the in that term that had been coined already, and she started to do a lot of exploration around it. And, and just brought up kind of several topics. Like she, she, she kind of sums it up as a way of looking at, a, at the subject position of black people that covers themes of alienation and aspirations for a better future. So she stops looking at that like we have no past side of things, right? She, it's very much about like what is our current state and what themes that we are struggling against can be brought up through, this, through, through, through Afrofuturism. And, and she starts to, to look at several topics around that things like there's no place for black bodies in the future according to sci-fi. Right. If if you look at what was written in sci-fi at that point, it's like just black people weren't even being written into the stories. We were imagining futures that didn't have any black people. And 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 I'll come back to this in a bit. I brought up in kind of one of the previous episodes, but it's the Jetsons, right? The Jetsons in the sixties. We look at a future where everyone's white. There's no black people in the Jetsons whatsoever. So you got a question like, what were the creators thinking at that point, right? Mm -hmm. Or not thinking. Uh, when they did stuff like that, um, uh, the, there's another kind of like controversial like like term that she starts to kicking around, which is what does it mean for Black people to have a future, right? And I definitely want to come back and talk about that one uh, because it leads into a further discussion around what is Black life beyond the current oppression, whether it's if we don't stop racism, what does it lead to, versus if Black people continue to be empowered, what does that lead to? Right. So there's there's definitely a notion of what does the future look like if as opposed to a fantastical future that we can not imagine versus what if we don't stop what's happening. Right. And it kind of like feels a little black mirror in terms of like if we don't stop this thing that's happening right now, what dark future does it lead to? But it could also be what positive future does it lead to? So there's the 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 approach towards our future starts to change. I feel a little bit at that point. So um, the, the, one of the next things I kind of like wanted to jump on is um, the past of Afrofuturism, right? It's like where now that we're, we know that that's a concept that's being discussed and actively debated, um, what are people retrospectively applying the Afrofuturism kind of tag to? And it goes all the way back, and I'm sure you can even go even further, uh, but the, in my research, what I found is there's a, a book in 1902, so turn of the century, uh, called Of One Blood. And it's interesting, it's written by Pauline Hopkins, and she's considered one of the most influential black writers of the first half of the, of the, of the 20th century. I had never heard of her. And, and that's, it goes, it's testament to our history, right? Mm-hmm. It's like just our history books don't cover this stuff, unfortunately. Um, but uh, she writes a story about a man that goes to Africa. And he's an African-American uh, born in the States. And he just doesn't really feel any real kingship or connection to the African continent. He's just like, they're them, we're us, we're Americans, we don't really care. Uh, and he goes there on an expedition to basically go and find archaeological digs to like bring back uh, treasures from, the, from Africa and stuff like that, right? The, the classical colonial story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when he arrives, he actually uncovers an advanced civilization in Africa that was 
technologically advance in the way that Wakanda is, right? That that we now now know about. Um, it, it's 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 written in the in 1902. So this is a co- topics that had not even been covered back then uh, at all. And then of course that leads him to a realization of who am I and why I should care about my connections to the African continent, right? And and that was like 1902. So that's kind of like one of the starts to where the movement starts to take shape. And then it gets followed by W.E.B. Dubois, uh, who wrote about a comet that lands in New York City, and it wipes out the entire city. This is in the 1920s. And only one black woman and one white man are, sorry, one black man and one white woman are left in all of New York City. Mm. And if you were to be a Betty man, you were to place bets on who's going to be the protagonist that saves the world, it's mm-hmm. not going to be the black man, according to what Hollywood has taught us, right? Yeah. That, that's the, the set. And in this case, it is. Like, mm. he ends up being the savior and the person that stands up for what should be right. Mm. And, and as soon as I read about the story, the first thing I thought of was The Stand, actually. Like, Stephen King's The Stand. Uh, because it's a similar thing. It's like in a world where most of civilization has been obliterated, there's two leaders left and one's white and one's black. And in the case of the stand, it's a black woman that leads people to the, the, the uh, I guess, the, the apocal- apocalyptic world where people actually try to embrace each other and rebuild society as opposed to like just try to rule over everyone, which is what the white man wants to do with that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, so that you can see how there's like connections between literatures written in the early half of the 20th century and what we're still seeing today. That's interesting. It's, it's interesting. The, going back to the, the Pauline Hopkins one, um, is that, do you think that directly influenced um, the Black Panther in terms of story? Because it, it's very much, or at least the basis of it, um, looks like it's influenced do you think that's to your humble opinion that's something that happened I'm, I'm not sure whether whether it did or didn't it just shows that the idea was already mm. floating around and that it, it took this long for them to make it into a movie is bonkers that, that, that's that, the thing that's, it's, it's uh, 100 and uh was it what was black panther released 2017 wasn't it yeah it's, more than 100 yeah. years beforehand this the story was there years, already yeah. <laughs> it's just a, uh, and it's 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 just weird that it's, it's a concept so it, it was imagined and it was released in 1902 so she, she must have worked on it for a bunch of years before that so you know and mm-hmm. you know turn of the century like you said mm-hmm. but then that it's not more into ingrained into our psyche that you know there's something that should be you know like again it's it's like going back to the my upbringing it's like damn we're we, literally again picturing africa or any sort of countries within africa or cultures within africa it's like right away you're thinking poor you know it's that it's it, it's it's mm-hmm. it shouldn't be like that you know it's like, <laughs> like I've, I've watched you know i've talked to so many people now you know i've, I've got so many um friends from for example zimbabwe and stuff like that and it's, and it, when it the the assumption you get from that is like well you know it's like a poor country but then they, they talk to you about yeah you know the normal things that you would with growing up and so the misconception and 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 the fact that um that misconception was already challenged back in 1900s mm. but yet it's not readily available for everyone to or it's not well known it's just annoying i found you know it's, it's slightly unfair unjust i don't know so many things and it and it speaks to like the fact that oppression is an active thing yeah like these yeah. things are are suppressed yeah. these stories are yes. suppressed like actively yeah. um yes because when as these stories are coming out like lots of africa is still colonialized it's still mm-hmm. under uh french uh, in the west obviously under um french and british rule at, at the time yeah yes and yeah so the you have that side of things where um, white-based countries are in charge of Africa and therefore they can portray what they see over there however they want in their own countries yeah. um, and then also um, uh, what's the other side of it they can portray it that way oh and then also you can always 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 say even today well that's unrealistic or yeah. people won't relate to that 
hmm. because the majority in Europe is uh, the majority of people in Europe are white or the majority of the media in Europe is white. So yeah. they can always say, well, uh, we could do that story, but it's no, it's never going to catch on. It's never going to sell. It's never going to, you can always belittle um, stories and concepts like that. And uh, in 1902, <laughs> it would have been way easier than 2002 Absolutely. or 2022. Yes. Um, but yeah, and that, that's part of why it was so great that Black Panther sold like it sold because you could no longer say black it's, stories don't sell. It's sort of the same argument I hear from, let's say, you know, for, for, I'm sure you've seen those videos online where you've, you've people ask a bunch of Americans, right? Like, oh, can you name that country in Europe? And you're like, yep. Oh, you know, and it's like, and I always heard the argument that's like, well, you know, they have to learn about their country, which is massive. They have 50 odd states and they have all this stuff. And it's, I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. Sure. To a certain point, it's a valid argument, but like, dude, this, this, the, one of the great things that we have, in, you know, in life is that we, we, most people, I still believe the majority of people have a, a thirst of, you know, to learn different things and things that are not part of their direct environment. I know you're shaking your head, but nope. Okay, maybe not a majority, but there's still people out there that are, that are winning. But if you're not presenting that at school already, it's it's it, it's you already, you know, it's just and we're talking we're talking about two two part of the worlds that are very much connected. In let's like, just between Europe and, and and the US, right? There's a lot of history between the two, and there's a lot of shared common cultural values. Let's say, um, so. But again, it's that you could say, well, you know what? There's a lot also history, good or bad, between mm. let's say us in Europe and, and and Africa and in the US and Africa. There's there's a lot to learn and to be learned. And it's uh, and like you said, to your point, Dave, it's like it feels that sometimes it's that on purpose is that story and that that relationship and um and any form of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Any form of any form of ideas or cultures that out of africa suddenly we it is portrayed to us as you know no they, they're just they just it's messed up beyond beyond any hope almost you know it's a hopeless situation <laughs> over there <laughs> why bother <laughs> you know it's not going to be interesting to anyone as a matter of fact it you know it's straight up isn't <laughs> you know to, to, to keep it simple yeah um, yeah and i find that extremely extreme you know yeah like you said wrong but also extremely sad and it's a weird way to look at you know the, the, the weird world you know point of view on the rest of the world i just find it a bit a bit weird but yeah anyway tangent and, and a lot of the time um it's because if you want to combat those beliefs and those opinions you have to look within yourself you have to yeah, as a right. society like yes. if we want to say oh well actually africa has this and this and this going for it or Africa used to have this and this and this going for it yeah. and now it doesn't well why is that yeah. like the story is about someone who's going on an ar archaeological dig and it's like okay well if the country they're in in America is so great why aren't they doing an archaeological dig in in America yeah. <laughs> what is in Africa that they don't have in America yeah. And then you have to look at those situations and those those issues that are there for everyone to see. Um, I hear the Queen's making a statement at 5 p.m. today. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're scared of this Oprah interview. Oh, God. And, yep. Oh, my God. I mean, if you want to really get into the crux of the issue that's going on right now, you have to go back and look at where the royal jewels came from. Indeed. Yep. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Like, Look, it, it's it, it gotta be honest it, it's having grown up in the third world but then gone to school in the u.s and being very much taught an american education mm -hmm. but then moving to europe and after the first two years or so mm -hmm. i was like okay yeah cool museums cool churches but then you start to question stuff and it didn't yeah. hit me until i went to the british museum and went to the of all places the basement <laughs> and they had uh two uh two uh funny enough they're like obelisk looking things we call them estelas uh from honduras and they were brought in from like the mayan ruins so like mm. like ancestors of ours right mm. the mayans and it's in a 
museum in downtown London. And it's just like, yeah. why? It, it, I'm like, no, there's <laughs> no point to this. That, 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 mm. that really shouldn't be here. Mm. Um, and, and it's just like, you start to look at those things through a very different lens. And, mm. and, and it's very interesting how that begins to change, but you don't get there without going somewhere else and getting a different perspective. Right. Yep. It's like if you stay, if you were born in, I don't know, Alabama and you lived your entire life in Alabama, you never left Alabama. Yeah. You're not going to get that point of view very easily. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it like teachers have to go above and beyond to show you that your parents have to go above and beyond to show you how things can be different. And, and that's one of the problems that we're not traveling enough and being curious enough is my view about other, other, other civilizations, because that's kind of how we landed in Afrofuturism. Mm-hmm. It's not I went like, oh, I feel like a moral duty to go explore this. It was more like, this seems interesting, and I get bored easily. I get bored <laughs> extremely easily. And, and I'm like, I, I, I don't want to read what I'm reading anymore. I want something new. And then I was like, wait, what's this about? I've heard like about Afrofuturism. So let's check out it. I'll, let's pick up a book. Mm-hmm. Loved it. I thought it was, mm-hmm. it was great. I was like, I'm, I'm entertained. I'm learning. I feel like this is useful. I'm like, let's dive in. And, and, and sometimes I take curiosity over like a moral need to do something because at least with curiosity, you can continue to foster it, right? Yep. You don't step away and go like, okay, I've learned what I need to learn. I know it sucks over there. That was, that was a tough upbringing to like grow up in Africa. I'm going to go and like make myself an omelet. It, 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 like you can, <laughs> you, you can just walk away from it, right? Whereas okay. so curiosity keeps you engaged. And, and I feel like we all need more curiosity about what's happening around the world. Indeed. Sure. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of happening around the world at this point uh, in the history of things that are now being labeled Afrofuturists, um, uh, there's a big gap between 1920s and 1960s, which I could not find a lot for, but I'm sure there is. Mm. But in the 1960s, coming back on topic, we get T'Challa for the first time in Marvel Comics. Uh, T'Challa shows up as the Black Panther in Fantastic Four number 52, uh, which I'm sure is now worth a ton of money uh, for somebody out there. Uh, sure. I hope. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. I, I, I hope it's owned by somebody that appreciates it as opposed to some dudes <laughs> that I don't care for. Uh, but anyways, moving on from that. Uh, we also, in the same year, we get what you talked about in a previous episode, uh, which David brought up. Uh, we get Uhura as part of Star Trek. Yeah. All right. And we, we touched on that briefly in the kind of the previous episodes on Black History Month about how, well, while the actress portraying Uhura wasn't crazy about the role she was given, there was a lot of, of pressure f- uh, from society, really, that she should continue because at that point, we weren't even talking about a story about her, but just representation, right? Mm-hmm. That was a big moment of representation in pop culture, nerd culture specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but from that point in the 60s, it th- like things begin to pick up and we get also Night of the Living Dead which I have mixed feelings about whether to give it that label or not. Uh, but it definitely gives you a scenario that ties into some of the tenets of Afrofuturism, which is placing a black man in a situation that he is adeptly, uh, uh, that he knows how to manage better than someone else because of his background, right? And in this case, it's like, who's going to have a better shot at, at surviving the zombie apocalypse? Probably someone black, at least in the States, and especially in the South of the United States, will have a better shot (laughs) because exactly because you used to survive like with everything that was happening, all the racism that was rampant throughout all the 20th century in, in the States. It's like, yes, it makes sense for that casting. Right. But unfortunately, and spoiler for a very old movie, but he dies. So it goes back to the classic trope of like, if you're black and you're a horror movie, you're gonna die unless it's being directed by somebody in the 20th in the 21st century <laughs> right uh, but 20th yeah. century let's be honest that was pretty much the, the the main theme which sucked um and so then that leads us into the 70s where we get blade uh and he shows up in tomb of dracula number 10 once again probably worth a ton now hope someone out there appreciates it mm-hmm. um and uh and 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 then we touch on now music right and then from a musical perspective we get sun Ra and we get Par- parliament funkadelic Yay. Weirdly, I, I got introduced to Sun Ra here in Portland. There yeah. at a Portland Art Museum, there was a whole exhibit on Sun Ra. I just wandered in because I saw a couple of cool images. I'm like, oh wait, that looks cool. I had no idea what the exhibit was about and just blew my mind. Like I had yeah. never heard of this at all. And this guy just went all in. 
So for anybody who's not familiar with Sun Ra, he was a musician in the 70s, had a lot of jazz inspiration to his music. But the his kind of main moment is when he creates an album that's followed by a movie called Space is the Place, which I love as a title. Mm-hmm. Um, and it basically is about him recruiting young people in Oakland to go out to space. And there's this notion of there's a better space for us and it ain't here and we need to go there. Right. Uh, that that is followed by Parliament Funkadelic uh, d- d- uh, having the, the album called The Mothership Connection, which very much as well talks about going somewhere else. And it's about yeah. returning to a place where we're appreciated, where we can be us. Mm. Uh, and a lot of those themes start bubbling up in music at that point, which I feel like they they were more obvious about the theme rather than being like implicit in the themes that we had before. Mm. Oh, by the way, if you've not seen uh, George Clinton or Parliament live, go see it. I actually went to see them. They, 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 were, they were touring uh, Europe once. And oh, for real? Com- completely stumbled on, upon them walking down the street once. And uh, they were wow. playing. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's a two-part story. They, they were walking around. So they, there's this jazz festival where my parents live. Um, one of the main jazz festivals around the world. Which you have all these big jazz names that are coming every year. Um, and it takes place in this old Roman amphitheater. So the acoustics is just right for it. Um, and then so the, obviously the town where the, the, the festival is set is like it's a tiny little town. Um, and you've got this, uh, and I was just walking around with my with my, with my mom. <laughs> just suddenly we see this massive entourage of like 30 weird looking dudes because they're all still wearing, you know, like funky get-ups, you know. It's like, like huh, what is that? And my mom was <laughs> like, yeah, it's uh, Parliament. Because <laughs> my mom was like, yeah, I know that. Anyway, and then um, thanks to a couple of connections, we uh, you know we found out that they were playing that night, and they were like, okay, cool, you know maybe you know it's tickets, everything was sold out because it sells out the year before. Um, but then we got we got to get in, and I saw them from, from the side, you know, the stage right there, and I was like, that is actually freaking awesome, yeah. you know, you get you get to see like seventy year old dudes smoking stuff um in the audience and it's like <laughs> is this uh is this normal <laughs> but then you listen to music but yeah the, the, and that, what i love is the music is so creative you know um and the outfit is very creative and it's out there and it's it's like nothing i've seen before um but yeah go check it out parliament's awesome inspiring snoop dogg also because uh you know yep. if you like snoop's up music there's a bit of that in there yeah. yeah, Josh Clinton. No, yeah, he's inspired everyone anyway. I think everyone knows um, West Coast rap at some point. I think they, they had a bit of Josh Clinton in there. But yeah, there's oh. a lot, a lot of samples. A lot, yeah. Samples, yeah exactly. Dre definitely sampled. Oh yes. yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, Dre. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that in there. But great music. So carry on. <laughs> Uh, cool. So uh, that leads us into w- the first big moment that I think uh, everybody that kind of have retro- has retrospectively received the Afrofuturism label looks at this moment as, or sorry, or, or this is one of those moments that's most important. And in terms of it really begins to lay down the seeds for a lot of authors that are, t- that are present today in Afrofuturism, and that is Octavia Butler. Uh, she writes her first novel in 1976 called Pattern Master. And um, what interesting about Octavia Butler is that she was very much kind of like West Coast, um, kind of like for the 70s, kind of like woke, uh, socially involved, uh, was in the Berkeley area, all that sort of stuff. I'm oh, sorry, in the Pasadena, in the California area, and was was beginning to write in a way that people were looking at at it beyond just like she's writing a black story and more like this is good sci-fi like this is a really interesting story and then and and that's what allowed it to really pick up and get more gravitas right because people were connecting with their stories at a human level and then along the way they were getting some education as well right so we look at like shows like Watchmen and whatnot like where it leads with basically as an episode it's a history lesson right the bombings in tulsa and then leads us into a story that we connect with at a human level right and and i feel like this all originated from octavia butler uh she was awarded the macarthur fellowship which it, i hadn't i'd really i'd heard about her a few times uh but I, I looked into it and it's basically like a grant that gets given out every year for geniuses right mm-hmm. so back then she was already being recognized but commercially she still didn't make a ton of money off of it not because necessarily the rights were still already 
everything. But while it took off, it still didn't take off like a Stephen King novel or anything like that. It still wasn't selling in the millions yet, right? Uh, but in 1979, she wrote Kindred. And I mentioned this in a kind of one of the previous episodes. And one of the reasons I feel this really compelling story, or, or this, this is probably the first full novel I read that was, that was considered Afrofuturist. And it basically deals with a woman that gets looped back in time without any control. So she gets sent back to antebellum South. So basically the slavery South. Um, and then she gets then flipped back to the present and then flipped back to the past. And she keeps going back and forth, right? The interesting about it is that she wrote this as a response to a student that kept saying, I don't know why our ancestors didn't stand up for our rights like slaves should have done more to liberate themselves not wait on someone to liberate them and she looked at him going like do you even understand what was happening then and she wrote a story where it takes a, per a person from the present day and puts them in the past and shows that even with all the knowledge we have today there's very little we could have done at that time to change what was happening mm -hmm. in terms of slavery so to me, that, that, that really signifies a lot of what Afrofuturism covers, which is like trying to give you an education, trying to touch on themes that can only be told through a lens of someone that lived through that oppression, but at the same time, still playing in the what we call the nerd world of just mm -hmm. like, yeah, time travel is definitely a thing there, and, yeah. and, 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 and it never gets explained. Mm -hmm. it never, she never gets into like, and this happened, she fell through a black hole, and then we get a like super nerdy mm -hmm. subject. No, she's like, no, it's not about that. Time travel mm -hmm. is just a means of telling the story. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to yep. use sci-fi to tell a story to educate you. And mm -hmm. that to me is what I absolutely love about Afrofuturism because it flips the script on a lot mm -hmm. of things we know. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, I'll wrap up the past with one last milestone. There's more to those, but there's one about which I really, really love, and it really kind of ties back into the nerd culture, which is Dwayne McDuffie. Uh, Dwayne McDuffie was an editor, uh, a writer and editor for uh, DC, uh, wrote a bunch of properties from like Justice League to, I believe, uh, Green Lantern, like all these properties he wrote for. Uh, but eventually he kind of like w w said, look, I'm kind of tired of not seeing representation in comics. And he started his own comic line with the blessing of DC, which I'll give him a lot of credit. I don't know commercially like how that played out for him, but at the very least DC was open to going like, yep, start up your own line, we'll support it. And he, ha and he had this partnership with DC to basically have them do the distribution, but he still have creative control over what he was doing. And he came up with characters that at the end of the day, to, to a certain degree, were analogs of some of the other characters within uh, Marvel, right? So he comes up with Static Shock, which is kind of like a play on Spider-Man. He comes up with Icon, which I believe is kind of a play on, 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 on Superman. He comes up with Hardware, which is a play on Iron Man, uh, but makes them all Black characters and gives them like inherently black stories. He's not just dropping them into the normal DC world or, or like a Marvel world or it may be. He's like, they get their own world. And this is where it makes sense to them. And, and those were super influential, very popular. But unfortunately, it was also the time where it ended the 90s, comics went through a big slump. So it was a really bad timing when he launched a company because unfortunately it, it did not have the legs commercially to keep going. Uh, and for a while, they just closed it down, and that was it. And then Dwayne McDuffie, I think, died in the early 2000s or something to that effect. Uh, now it's being resurrected, and we're getting Static Shock back. Actually, Static Shock, the original cartoon series, was just added to HBO Max, and we know they're going to remake it into – and I'm – I'm not 100% sure it's either a series or a movie that's going to be being remade, but they're actively looking to making Static Shock because he's one of the most popular characters from that universe. Mm. And, and that to me is again, it also ties into the Afrofuturism kind of themes of just like he did it on his terms. He wasn't just filling in existing sci-fi property with black characters. He was creating his own universe with his own rules, own terms, own mythology. And that to me is like, that, that, that's more of the creator-led uh, IP that I want to see more of. So that's the past of our futures, and guys, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting, like, to hear about those areas and see those areas, because some of it, I think being born, when I was born in the late 80s, like, you took for granted having uh, Black characters on screen uh, in terms of um, things like Lieutenant O'Hara being a big deal. I didn't know that at the time. Um, yeah. And I think back to my dad watching the Star Trek series is um, rather than the movie. So it wasn't um, her era, but the yep. next generation really took off in yep. the 90s, Voyager and all of those. Yep. And I never really thought of 
the fact that there was so much black representation in the, in that those kinds of shows um and it, it's that same lineage that carried on through um but because of the time that we were in some of it i just took for granted it's interesting to go back and think to what it must have been like to have those first seeds sown um all those years all those years ago yeah no exactly you look at a lot of the authors that are writing afrofuturism today and that's the main thing they quote they're like i loved all this sci-fi but i could never see myself in any of it not only mm. from a representation perspective but in terms of how i would react to that situation it's like that is not how i was raised to react to that specific situation i think mm. that was one of the main things that 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 got them to write a lot of these authors say like i i wrote angry because I, mm. I, 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 it, I, it's not that I didn't see myself. I didn't see my behaviors at all. Mm. And I wanted my behaviors to be seen. Like, this is how I perceive the world. And I wanted that to be out there, right? So. Yeah. And then um, just to cover another area, um, when you mentioned originally about um, things being retrospectively labeled Afrofuturism, yeah. um, the first thing I visualized was old uh, Busta Rhymes videos old yeah. Missy Elliott videos, mm. um, mm -hmm. Janet Jackson, yep. uh, Michael Jackson. Um, yeah, thinking back to some of the futuristic videos that they had in the in the mid to late 90s. Um, also, um, the California video, which is uh, a oh, black, Tupac and Dre. Yeah. Yeah, black oh, version of Mad Max. Mad Max. Of course, so. yeah. Um, yeah, and just little things like that that I never would have thought of as afrofuturism at the time which i guess yeah. do represent that um yeah oh i i think missy elliott is a huge influence it's like mm. she took such a leap from a uh, just being a female hip-hop artist to like body representation to then not only that but like then going like full-on like crazy sci-fi in her videos mm. it it, mm. it it would have not made any financial sense to do that in that day like mm at all like if you look at what any of her predecessors were doing it made no sense for her to do that yeah she took the leap and that to me is awesome mm. yeah for That's sure so she's one of the greatest yep yep uh so yes i, I agree Th there's a lot of like those videos we can look back on uh but then we can move on to the present and this is funny enough this is the part that i'm very keen on like getting some of your thoughts on because there's a lot of interesting things that are that are happening right now in afrofuturism so i'll throw out a couple of names uh, nk jemison and neti okorafor read everything they make because <laughs> so much of their stuff is going to be developed into movies and shows it's nuts um so nk jemison uh she has been one of the most successful afrofuturist writers of the last 25 years and and i want to make successful i mean like commercially successful and and critically successful like she sold a ton of books uh she writes novels but she's moved on to also get involved in other projects and uh one of the, her claims to fame is that she won three hugo and nebula awards for her broken earth trilogy of novels and for anybody who's not familiar out there with kind of like the the nerd awards uh circuit um the hugo and nebula awards are like the top and they're kind of like the oscar Oscars and Golden Globes of, of sci-fi and fantasy, right? And, and usually the authors that are there are like the Neil Gaiman's of the world, Alan Moore's, like Stephen King's and stuff like that. Like those are the people showing up to those award shows. She, she's the first person to win the award three years in a row, period. Not only a first black person, like first person to do it. Um, and uh, I'm just making my way through the Broken Earth trilogy. I'm like just about to finish the second book. Fascinating, guys absolutely fascinating from the perspective of it is not sci-fi set in a way that we recognize uh because usually take these concepts of like oh let's talk about big technology and all these yeah. things and, uh, and like oh or like in the future there's like all this magic and uh, uh. this takes place in a world that doesn't feel too removed like she takes on themes of climate change so one of the bad guys in the book is actually climate change uh, but at the same time, within the book, there is a there's like several groups of people uh, and uh, some of the people have a specific power that is able to help with that climate change. And even though they're some of the most powerful people in the in the mythology, they're also the most oppressed people because people don't know they fear them. They fear their power. And then they go, OK, we're not going to kill you because we need you. 
but we're going to get you to do only what we want to do. And that means not ever being your true self. And there's so many things that cross over there in terms of what we know of history, right? But she's doing it in a way that's empowering because the protagonist is one of the people that has those powers. And you see her struggle with the back and forth of being indoctrinated into this is what we want you to be versus who I am and how she slowly comes out of that and has her own agency. The, the whole thing is just reading really nice. And I, 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 this one, I'm like fascinated to see where it's going to end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just the journey with the characters has just been so nice so far. Uh, I, can, I know they're going to be developing this into a series for Amazon. Uh, the for oh, uh, right. in the next couple of years, so that that's how big that one is. Uh, mm-hmm. She, yeah. So uh, um, N.K. Jemison is also now writing for DC, so she's writing for the Green Lantern series, uh, and it's called Far Sector. Which, once again, I've heard it uh, mentioned so many times as one of the, like the Green Lantern runs you need to pick up Far Sector. But interestingly, like no one mentioned as like, oh, you need to pick it up because it's written by a black author. It's like, no, it's like, this is a really good, good run. And only then to realize that actually it was N.K. Jemisin writing it. And she basically creates the first black female Green Lantern core member, right? She's got to go defend a planet and she's black and she's female. And apparently like the storyline is very, very cool. Well, I'll keep an eye out for that one. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, so then the other one, uh, and this is the one that is, is really the, I'd say the controversial agent in, 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 in Afrofuturism. And she's very much challenging like a lot of the assumptions in a very interesting way, I, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and this is where I want to link back to something you said earlier, David, uh, about just Africa versus African-American um, mm-hmm. uh, literature. Uh, but uh, Nnedi Okorafor, she is a African American of Nigerian descent, but she's made it a big point of having a real connection with Nigeria, and that was down to her parents taking her back to Nigeria like every summer, spending a lot of time there, and then looking at Nigeria through a Western eye, but knowing that she's connected to that culture and trying to kind of be connected to it, right? Uh, and that's a, that's something that all of us that have been immigrants struggle with, right? It's like, how do you connect back to your culture when you've been away from it for so long? Um, but she has this awesome analogy about sci-fi and Afrofuturism. And she's like, it's like octopus, an octopus and a human. She's like, octopus, Pie, I guess, uh, sure? and humans <laughs> or octopuses. No, no that's, that doesn't sound right. Uh, octopi, yeah. <laughs> and humans are among the most intelligent animals on earth, yet their types of intelligence are totally different. And, uh, and funny enough, and, and I can actually val- fully vouch for this because we have a friend that's actually a doctor in like octopi studies. Um, and, uh, and, and there's some really interesting research happening in the world, but point being is that she sees that as sci-fi and Afrofuturism. They are both great ideas that develop in different ways. We should not try to mix them up as genres as like one led to the other. No, no, no. She's like, I, I don't want Afrofuturism roots to be in sci-fi. I want Afrofuturism roots to be in Africa. Right, because that's how it developed, and it should be its own thing, right? So, so she's gone on to then make a point of differentiating, and this is where I want to tie back: African futurism to Afrofuturism, and African Jujuism to like the fantasy world, and and what that essentially means is that she sees African futurism, and 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 I I can best sum it up an example she gave. Right, she says. It's a subcategory of, of sci-fi similar to Afrofuturism, but more deeply rooted in African culture and history. As an example, a, uh, sorry, as an example, Wakanda at the end of, of, of Black Panther, they build out their first international outposts in Oakland, California. They're like, they yeah. want to go help the kids in Oakland, right? So it's like, there's a, maybe a little tie into like the Sun Ra story and stuff like that, right? So I, I, I get like thematically why they would have gone there. But, but her point is in African futurism, Wakanda builds their first outpost with a neighboring African country, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. Huge distinction, yeah. huge distinction. It's, mm. it, it makes it an African centric versus African inspired. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and she does the same thing with African Jujuism, which is she considers a subcategory of fantasy in the same way, but built around African mythos and spirituality. Right. It's like, how do you take African mythology and extend it into a magical realm? Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not based on Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Right. At this point. Yeah. So so that's and she, and she 
fights hard. Like I've seen a lot of interviews. She gets upset, man, at people um, because she's like, no, 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 no. We have to fight for this to be art. It cannot mm. just be a subgenre of something else that already exists. Mm. Yeah, yes, which is good points. Fair enough. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's. Um, I always equate that with. Um, might sound stupid like you know when you say for example black owned companies you know it's like you 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 just don't want to um have one side of the business you want to have the entire business you know which if you're into for example go back to music you just don't want to be um producing you just want to have the the entire thing you want to have your your own um deal to distribute the music and and, mm. and control every part of it so it's the same mm. thing with that it's just like it's, you don't want to take it you know have just a, a, a share of the pie you want to have the entire thing and making mm. your own 100 mm. percent can't be mad at that to be fair <laughs> yeah yeah it's yeah funny. well yeah to build off that same um analogy like what's the point in supporting black artists if they're working for white companies exactly yeah <laughs> right. right because ultimately they're the ones that are going to benefit more of it than the artist ever will um and yeah and i i think her perspective is an interesting and powerful one and, and it needs to be um, that way in a lot of ways um, just because uh, there there is so much um, knowledge and power in Africa that needs to be um, spoken about in and of itself um, like interestingly I was watching the news and they had um one of the leading scientists in the world um, who happened to be African. And I felt like they really made a point of reading through all of his achievements because it, he wasn't on there just because he was African. He was on there because he was qualified. Yeah. Like Correct. very yes. qualified in and yes. of himself. It doesn't matter that he didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. He didn't go to um, any of the Ivy League schools in America. He got his education in Africa, built himself up to where he was, um, where he's one of the top um, scientists in um, the organization who, WHO. Um, and yeah, and it, he's African built, African made, African born, African everything. And he's an expert in his field. Yeah. Um, and he he's best qualified to do what's being asked at that moment. Yeah. Not because color skin, just because he is best qualified. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and that, that's a, one of the themes that, that I think comes up with, with Nettie Corfor that I really love that, that she's trying to like flip the script on a lot of stuff. Uh, two things that come out are uh, one colonialism. Uh, she has a book called Lagoon. Um, and I believe it takes place in Nigeria, but maybe wrong about that one. But, uh, but point being is that she basically sets this, this story where it's an alien invasion. And if you look at alien invasions, they have all been metaphors for colonialism, right? <laughs> at the end of the day. And that's why the aliens are never good. They always come to wreak havoc <laughs> because it's, it's a metaphor for colonialism, right? And, uh, and she flips that. And she's like, what if the aliens showed up to help, right? Uh, what if they actually were here to help? It's like, who's best qualified to tell that story? Someone that was actively part of colonialism, or someone that experienced colonialism. Somebody can they, they can think of like what it could, how it could have been different for all of us if people had tried to help instead of displace us all around the world, right? And it's like I'm like yes, yes, you are uniquely qualified to tell that story, not someone else. And, and that to me is what 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 where it helps to have the label uh, because it then and then allows you to have that authority, right? That presence. Don't you find it interesting that simultaneously an alien invasion is um, considered a negative thing and is linked to colonialism, but colonialists don't link <laughs> colonialism to negativity yeah. or, or being any kind of alien invasion? <laughs> that is the deep irony we live in, buddy. <laughs> That's the irony, yeah. yeah. It, but it, again, like because obviously being French, like the, the 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 number of countries that our governments has colonized in in, in the very recent past, right, mm -hmm. is is just absolutely crazy. But again, that's not something that's been taught at school. It's not something that you or even if it's you know you you briefly um, look at it, but it's not taught in a way that you think about it and um, 
think about it critically, you know, and mm. um, form an opinion about it. Mm. It's only very recently when these things came up because uh, without, you know, divulging too much about my, my work life is that the, the person who sat next to me is from Senegal. So we, you know, apart from yeah. the pilot, we both speak French and we, so we, we, we spend a lot of time sat next to each other when we were allowed to go into the office. Um, and there's a lot of things that he told me and I was like, what the hell are we doing as a, mm. as a, as a country? Like, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's true that the way that it is framed to you is never, it's never a bad thing. It's never mm. a bad thing. It's, it's yeah. always that, well, you know, they benefit from us. <laughs> Just like, okay. Some would say benefit, some would say we're still, you know, no. depends how you frame it. But, and you know, for example, you told me about I'm not going to bore everyone with it, but like the the, the way the, the financial system is set up, for example, in his country in Senegal, it's just like it's just racketeering. You know, it's just we just basically um, they print money for us, and then we borrow. You know, we take away, and then we borrow it to them. So they have mm. to borrow money from us as a French government, and then they have to pay huge interest on that <laughs> on that oh, yeah. is on that loan. Is yeah. just thinking, oh, like, yeah. huh? How do huh? How is that mm. the thing? Um, but feel free to look it up on Google. It's 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 all up there. Um, it's it, it's just it's just yeah. It's it, like you said, Dave. It's very interesting that those points are not really talked about. They're not really you know that 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 irony um, mm. is it, not never really talked about. And then then I can't tell you where it comes from. Well, you can picture where it comes from, but mm. um, it's I, I just one of my questions. That I wonder how long. Um, this is going to be ignored in a way, you know, especially in the school mm. system. Like, what, what's going to be the flip that is going to um, make it that it's talked about freely and that students are actually given proper facts about what's going on and what happened in, in, in the very near past? Yeah. Uh, but um, again, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, for the first time um, as a supply teacher, had to teach a lesson on British colonialism. Mm. And it was ah. so refreshing. Uh, I'm not a history specialist or anything, but it was so. I was. I saw it, and I was like, "They're teaching this now. Like this is incredible." Yeah. Um, and it was as gory and as blunt <laughs> as you could be about the things that went on. Um, and that was being taught to year eights, I think, at the time. And that was two years ago. Um, but yeah, I was happy to see it and happy to happy to teach it. Yeah. Um, it has to be done to, yeah, yeah to a class of predominantly white kids as a black man <laughs> yeah it was great yeah yeah and and and, and that's and the thing is like still in, in the states we're having an ongoing battle about how much of this we bring into history and not um like for example like the the tulsa bombings is like there's still states that are not going to teach that i can guarantee you i mean really? when you still have people like i mean just yesterday, I don't want to get political, but like we just had people burning masks in Idaho. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're we're a long way from accepting these universal truths, mm-hmm. um, and and we got to start somewhere. And and a lot of times, it, to I, I, yes, I'm going to quote Mary Poppins: "A spoon is full of sugar makes the cinnamon the was it the cinnamon go down?" Right? Mm-hmm. And and it's it's sometimes if we do these things through pop culture, people will get it. Rather than they're like, oh, it's being yeah. taught to me. It's an institution that I value as being objective. Da 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 this and that. Where I was like, but yeah, I'll go watch Black Panther, uh, mm-hmm. sort of thing, right? It's like, and that that's where pop culture is important. Yeah. It does shape how we how we perceive things, uh, and it and and because the kid that won't have the lesson where they get taught what colonialism actually meant can pick up a novel, can pick up a story, a book, mm-hmm. uh, a show, a video game that teaches him what that actually was like. Yeah, and right on the flip side, that's a big reason why when Shuri yelled "colonizer" at the yes. American Shield agent, mm-hmm. best joke in the whole film. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally, 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 totally. Because also, like, he totally is that part. Like, he plays that yeah. part so well, and and that we talked about in the previous episode. But like, we're glad that he didn't get written as the white savior because it would mm-hmm. totally undone all those moments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, it, it's. If you look at the the story of colonialism, and and how we continue to tell it, I I see it in such a mixed way, and I'll, I'll be very honest. Something that I'm still working through is that I was brought up in a third world country, 
Uh, but at the same time, I was brought up with an American education and very much was brought up to assimilate into American society. That's why I mm. sound so, so American. Mm. Um, it's something that I'm still working through uh, yeah. because I'm like, wait, a lot of stuff I was taught, it helped me to get to, to have the adventures I have had in life. But at the same time, I have to question what I learned. Because it was very much like, oh yeah, the conquistadors were awesome. Like, like all those dudes that came to <laughs> Mexico and Peru, they were amazing. They were super good. They helped all the local people. Da, da, this and that, and 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 that's not the reality. Not yeah. And 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 the capitalistic colonialism we have still mm. in in Latin America still not cool. We had we were considered a banana republic uh, because basically Chiquita Banana and Dole, which. Because of those companies, I was able to get the education I got, but at the same time, they ripped off so many people mm -hmm. and they literally killed people by, mm -hmm. by like having people work fields while they were fumigating yep. the field. Mm -hmm. And then people were basically poisoned to death slowly, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot there to, to deal with. And that's why, so it's not an easy topic. There's a lot to unpack there for, for even people that aren't white. Um, there's so much to, 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 I don't know, to come to terms with. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, but moving on from colonialism, the other one that's interesting is that she wrote, and this one is getting developed as well. Uh, that she wrote, uh, so this is just come back to uh, Nettie Corifor. She wrote um, a book called Binti, uh, and it's about an African girl that's a mathematical genius and gets to go off on an adventure to go to university that's in a different planet. And she's the first person to go to university in a different planet, right? And, and that seems like a super fun story and stuff. Uh, but her theme behind it is I wanted to write a story where an African body left the content willingly. Mm. She's like, I wanted to tell that story. Of just like yeah. how 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 does this happen? Where you're not dis displaced, you're not taken away, you're not enslaved, whatever it may be, or like you don't leave because there's 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 nothing good happening in Africa and you need to go get a better life somewhere else. It's like no, no she leaves because she wants to get educated and help her people, mm -hmm. um, and and then of course and she develops these powers and she has to come to terms with them and there's there's a whole story that won't blow, uh, uh, that I won't like ruin for you guys. Uh, but uh, but it's definitely one that has a lot of traction right now in terms of like nerd culture. A lot of people are very interested in the story coming to life with Binti. Uh, she's, mm -hmm. she's considered like one of the best characters that, uh, that Akora 4 has written. Uh, That's kind of awesome just because um, you forget that black people did travel and did Correct. go and learn in other countries and Correct. where they did like slavery wasn't the only way that black people <laughs> traveled around exactly europe traveled to america traveled to all of these places um it's yeah it's just another one of those stories that just isn't told yeah correct uh so so the last point on a core four is that she is writing uh the shuri uh, comic run right now. Uh, I think I mentioned previous episodes. I'm reading it. I'm like, I think now three quarters through it and uh, super good. Just uh, there, there's one moment that I, I'll, you guys consider the episode to listen to the other points of it. But I just got to a point where she meets up with Miles Morales mm. and it is just such a good moment mm -hmm. uh, because they both, it's funny because they both make the acknowledgement that they've been living under someone else's shadow. Yeah. And, 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 and Miles says like, well, for me, it's Spider-Man. She's like, for me, it's T'Challa. Mm. And it just has a really good connection moment that I'm like, yeah, it's not like they showed up and it's like, let's web sling together, like take out someone. And they do have like a little battle with some people and stuff, but it's that, yeah. that's not the main point. It's just about them showing up and going like, oh yeah, I'm you and you're me, aren't I? And, and it's nice to give Shuri that moment where I'm like, yeah, I feel she needs more of a story to be told. And, and the whole story to T'Challa's gone. He's in, mm. he's in a wormhole and mm. they can't find him. And and it's very interesting how the politics of Shuri being pushed into being Black Panther is a very big deal in that book. Where she's like, but I don't want to be my brother. Like I want to be my own person. And and that's slowly developing, which is really cool. Uh, so uh, to wrap up kind of the present state of Afrofuturism, one incredibly interesting uh, f uh, figure that I found or, 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 or uh, a stat is that 8% of the top 100 grossing sci-fi movies feature black protagonists, 8% out of the movies. And half of the time it was Will Smith. So pretty okay. much Will Smith accounts for half of the representation of only 8% of all the, the highest grossing sci-fi movies. I'm like, we need to change that. 
<laughs> we, yeah. that needs yeah. to change. And, and some of the people leading the pack on that, like, I just find it so funny with Will Smith. I'm like, God bless him, man, but we need <laughs> someone else too. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, we look at Janelle Monet, uh, all the authors that I, that I looked about, in particular, N.K. Jemison is obsessed with Janelle Monet and just okay. go back and watch her videos. Mm. She takes what Missy did to the next level. It's like such next level stuff that General Monet is doing. Uh, even you have Beyonce uh, with kind of the latest round of videos. We have that video that's yep. set in like 2044. Uh, there's a lot of like futurist themes in her in her styling and clothes and stuff, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and if you haven't heard, uh, we talked about Parliament, actually tying back to Parliament Funkadelic. Have you guys heard of Flying Lotus? Uh, so check out anything that Flying Lotus is doing along with Kamazi Washington. So they're this crew. It's actually Flying Lotus, Kamazi Washington, Terrace Martin, and uh, I knew I'd heard uh, of Flying Lotus. Uh, yeah, it's through Terrace Martin. Terrace Martin, and then and Ro Robert Glasper. Mm. Uh, they're just doing really interesting things at like intersection of hip hop and jazz. Mm. Um, and in the case of Flying Lotus, it's more like intersection of like hip hop, jazz, and like electronic music. Mm. Uh, but point me is like he is going out there on just like super futuristic stuff built into his movies, and, sorry, into his um, uh, into his music. But he does music videos, and his live sets are like these immersive experiences to have like these crazy light shows. Sometimes I think you even have to show up to the shows with like three D glasses to like check out everything he's doing. Just like way out there, really interesting stuff he's doing. Uh, same with Kamazi Washington. If you're like a jazz uh, fan, he's he's basically very, definitely taking the genre in a different direction. Uh, and then we could tie back to something that uh, David mentioned earlier, Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, writing for Black Panther right now uh, and beginning to write for Superman, which we can touch on in, in a bit. Yeah. I'm going to leave you guys with one recommendation that's not, that I actually missed from the previous round of recommendations, which I definitely want to plug. Uh, it's called The Wicked and the Divine. And it's a graphic novel series that has about, I think, 10 volumes. Um, and The Wicked and the Divine is this. The premise is there are these gods that just exist in society, but their godhood is very similar to a pop star. Right. So it's kind of like all the gods are analogs of like Rihanna, Kanye, like <laughs> everybody that's super famous. They're like analogs are more or less, even though they don't get called that. But mm. their names are gods of like ancient Egypt. Uh, and, and they very much take their, their, their origins from like ancient, ancient mythos. Right. Uh, but the thing is that they come back every nine years and then live for two years and then die and then come back every nine years, right? If you look at it through a lens of, of pop culture, it's like pop culture kind of recycles itself every decade. And I think they're trying to make a point of that in the graphic novel um, because all the characters, they die and then come, they come back. But every time they come back, they kind of like take forward their stories, uh, but their motivations are very much around African mythos. Like there's a lot of mythology built into it in terms of like who they are. And some characters are even, even hard to understand where you have to go back and actually read a little bit of mythology to understand like why they did the things they did. Mm. But the way they interact and just their stories and they're like some people that are just like super selfish, others want to help others. But it becomes this thing about like the, the, the reaction of fans to pop stars, which they consider gods, which a lot of times in today's world, you can consider the same thing. But knowing that those gods are black, right? That, that's what flips the script on, 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 on this story. And I really am enjoying or enjoyed like reading through it because of that. Because it's like, all oh, right, yeah, right. It's like some of the biggest stars we have and there are some most powerful people in the world mm. are actually just pop stars that, that, that sometimes happen to be black. And to your point, David, it's like, who's paying these guys or actually making a ton of money, but we've now gotten people like in the Beyonce's where they're paying people. Like mm. Jay-Z is selling title to Square for a ton of money, right? Mm, yeah. Dr. Dre is cashing out to Apple, right? Mm. It's like all of a sudden you see those moments like, yeah, no, no, they have their moment that's arriving, right? And it only happens sporadically. It doesn't happen continually, which that would be a more of a white narrative. It's like, it happens every couple of years. And that's why I thought like, it brings some interesting themes together. So definitely check it out. The Wicked and the Divine um, uh, came out a few years ago. So the run is fully done. It has an ending. So you have to like wait for the ending or anything. That's what we'll do. Yeah. No, I, I definitely like to see more um, based in African mythos, even if it does have to be um, Egyptian or otherwise. Uh, like I mentioned on the last episode, like there's Egypt isn't the only country in Africa. Um, right. And I think there is 
something I, I find it happens more in America than it does here but there's there's almost this thinking of Africa as a country rather than a continent yeah and like you said about Wakanda um in Okafor's um interpretation of it they would have sold or not sold but they would have helped a neighboring African country right. rather than helping America um I feel like people forget that there is African, there are other African countries with their own cultures. Like Zimbabwean culture is very different to the culture in the Gambia. They're on opposite sides of the biggest, one of the biggest continents in the world. Um, South Africa going up to um, Egypt. It's the distance is insanely large. Like they are very, very different places. Um, and Africa has multiple different cultures and different cultures within the same country as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. If, if you just look at um, how different the South of England is to the North of England and the culture divide there, and then consider the fact that England would fit two, three, four times into most African countries, yeah. it, you can begin to sort of, think about how vast and how varied um a place the continent of africa actually is oh, yeah but like I, I i was working with this guy who's from nigeria and is that is like every time you talk about nigeria and he he and he would interact with somebody else who was from nigeria and it's like suddenly it's like this is when you realize the not only on an african but like everyone around the world mm. right but it's like the the how how you can go into a microscopic level in terms of the differences in cultures like he was like well i'm yeah. from that part of i'm not from that part of nigeria and it's like well if you go on the west west well you know mm. the western part yeah. of of nigeria yeah. is completely different almost like different country different dialect yeah. different language you're like totally. oh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> stop freaking totally. out you know uh, but again it's like it's, it's the same in every country but it's true that it's mm. it, even so with africa and the way it's portrayed it's like well africa is one giant country like, okay cool um no, it isn't. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's, 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 it's the same we, we we get it also you know um we, with asia also it's like this when you say asia well, where do you go first shut china like mm. well not really you know with even within china you know you, you, you have yeah. different languages you have different cultures you know but you, you still have the philippines you still have thailand you still have japan you yeah. still have you know it's, it's the same with africa yeah. and, it's, and it's it's the fact that it's not again i still go, go back to the education system that is still not um we don't go where you know we don't go anywhere near um the, the intricacies and, and and the differences within each continent mm. and i think you know, i always feel like even more so with africa like you know again thinking back about my studying years is is when we discuss africa it's egypt mm. south african history also because of mm-hmm. again the very recent past and mm-hmm. for us um, algeria and morocco and mm. tunisia you know mm. so it's like the countries that are directly um, and really? senegal maybe a little bit but you know mm. but, um, it's it's still very very lightly discussed compared mm. to the rest and then i always felt and i you know it's and i keep going back to the same point it's like well when i was asking um, i remember one year i asked my history teacher i was like well we're not talking a bit more about you know xyz in africa it's like well we, you know we have a rich history and i was like yeah but that's part of it <laughs> it's part of <laughs> it you go. um i can't i i should be told I, I couldn't care less about our kings you know you you guys probably know my stance on on monarchy and all that yeah. stuff but like mm. uh, i'm just slightly more interested in more recent developments than, than what happened in, in 1600s to uh, king whatever um so and, and that that development includes large swaths of africa and and yeah. the history and, and what it stands for um and again m- most of um what we know and most of what humanity what well, where it comes from is from that one single continent you know it's not it's not it's not even a uh, something that is hidden anymore it's not something that we should should shy away from it's something that should be analyzed and discussed a little bit more in, right. in within our schools yeah. right it would benefit everyone right yeah um yeah. but yeah going back to the the point of african mythology um that was a big reason why I connected with um, uh, JP Jackson at the conference. And 
uh, I then last week went on to watch Blood of Zeus on Netflix, um, which is uh, a story about um, Greek mythology, yeah. um, about one of Zeus's sons um, and uh, like the ancient battle between the gods on Olympus and the Titans. And as much as I enjoyed it and I did thoroughly enjoy it and like Greek mythology is great and very interesting. Mm. I did have a real hunger for something about African mythology yeah. and there just is so little out there. Um, there is. Like if I could watch something like that based on African gods or African magic, um, like it would just be so interesting to me. Having consumed different uh, mythologies and things like that, like you spoke about um, Mayan culture earlier, uh, that's something that I got a look at. Um, through Tomb Raider, the third Tomb Raider game, they yeah, explore yeah. South America and um, super interesting, um, like lore. And they, you know, you pick up little artifacts and it tells you a little bit about about the culture and uh, and things like that. And uh, I've mentioned before that um, Assassin's Creed Origins helped me learn a lot about uh, Egyptian mythology. Yeah, um, it would just be awesome to learn not only more about Egyptian mythology but other other african mythologies and have those stories told because all of them are interesting yeah. Vic yeah. viking mythology um is quite big right now with the show vikings and yeah. god of war and um thor being so popular yep. um yeah and all of it is amazing but there's just this hole right yeah <laughs> there's just this gap um in the, one of the biggest continents in the world <laughs> yep, exactly. Not and being told. So something that kind of blows your mind a little bit is that if I were to ask you guys, is there a difference between California and Texas? You would instantly know. Yeah. And if I ask you, is there a difference between Namibia and Uganda? It would be harder to say that. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's what, are their, what are their actual cultural Absolutely. differences you can point yeah. to? Yeah. It would be harder. And yeah. that, that, that like is the problem right there. Like, why, why, why should people know about Texas and California? It's just a state within a country, right? Yeah. It's like, dude, we're talking about two actual different autonomous countries, right? And we don't know the difference between them. Yeah. So, yes, I agree. There's more education. Yes, it's, it's, it's largely, on, um, on, you know, uh, depicted in, you know, it's, it, you, can't, you can't really know about it unless you meet somebody from there. You know, like all, all my um, culture about Africa in, that I've gained in the last couple of years even you know more than that is it's coming from working with people from there and it's not nothing to do with what's in the media or what's available online it's literally it just talking to them and this is when you realize well hey i actually don't know that much mm. um because it's it's underrepresented everywhere mm. you know and there's only a limited a number of those spots right yeah like for yeah. those people to make it from those countries to work yeah. for a, a company as prestigious as the company you work for mm it's like one in millions <laughs> yeah it, you know it's just it's just on our team at the time we were like a team of 10 it was like well one guy from well one girl from from zimbabwe and then the rest was less you know there was me the french guy and then the rest was just british people so it was just a, <laughs> in terms of representation he was uh not quite there but hey that's a different topic <laughs> so david said give me more African culture. Yep. Hold my beer. Let's go into the future. So yes. uh, looking into the future, we have first and foremost, uh, Black Panther, uh, sorry, or more so Marvel has said that they will create a Black Panther Tales of Wakanda series. Mm -hmm. So finally, we get a little more about Wakanda. Uh, I personally think they're going to draw from this Shuri comic run, because even in this Shuri run mm -hmm. that Akora Force uh, creating, it is about Shuri, but it's also about like funny enough, the politics within Africa. There's like a council of African countries that are pressuring Wakanda to join them and be and and basically help the rest of Africa, right? So I think is, there, is there's it a, is so it a comic? many stuff. Is it going to yeah. be a comic? Or is it going to be a TV? Oh, um, no, sorry. Th this is going to be a, a TV series. I'm saying it might oh, be right, based cool. on this comic because the, yeah. that, that, that side of the politics is definitely coming through. It's coming through the Tennessee Coats run in, in, mm. in, in Black Panther mm -hmm. as well. So I, I really hope that that's the premise of this is just a relationship with Wakanda to other countries in Africa. I think it would be a mm. really interesting show. Absolutely. Um, we, we, we got Lovecraft Country. <laughs> 
so much love. Tom knows, like, I got so much love for that show. It is just one of the best things I've watched on TV. But interestingly, it is based on a book that has now, the show has basically reached a conclusion. So in the same way of Game yeah. of Thrones, where like they caught up to the book, um, they're now talking about making a Lovecraft Country season two. It is not approved yet, but the writers are trying to find out how to extend the story, right? Um, I won't spoil the end. There's something in the end that I'm like, mm, maybe you can't, but I think there's enough. I don't think they should continue that story. I think they should continue stories in that world because yeah. it's definitely there's a lot of more stories to tell in that world um if you haven't watched it go watch it it is just i have got my hands on it i just need the time to get to it now so i will i will give it a, yeah. give it a watch and, and and this is the, the what i love the uh, time doesn't go on and on about this the the show literally you can you can just drop and watch one episode and be totally satisfied mm-hmm. uh not because it's episodic because each episode has such a definitive theme like one of the episodes is just a mashup of Indiana Jones and Tomb Raider um, through the lens of the people that are already in the show. They basically have to go find a thing and like jump through like different obstacles and like obviously there's booby traps, stuff like that. One of the most fun action movies that I've watched in the last couple of years was actually that episode. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, there's an episode where like one of the characters goes in this journey through time and it's just really fascinating how, like, because her name is Hippolyta. And um, and she's kind of one of the minor characters and just shows up and just like dominates one entire episode. And just watch an episode on its own is super cool because she basically like warps through like different points in time. But every time that she goes to like the next point, she has to name herself. And right. And there's this whole thing about like names and the powers that names have. Right. Mm-hmm. And it like that, that has a lot of a big connection to kind of like African culture, but also in terms of like how names were repurposed with African Americans that were brought over. Right. It's like, so the, the, yeah. the notion of being able to claim your name was a big theme in that episode. And every time that she jumps to a different point, she names herself something else. And then she becomes that in that other reality. Right. So she's like dumping, jumping through universes and she finally comes back to her world where he, where she embraces her name again. And she comes back to the normal world and just guys, it is just so well done. Like there's action. There's like all this really cool, like, like special effects, but same time and her acting and like the place she goes to cannot say enough. So <laughs> that is another one to be looked forward to. Hopefully Lovecraft season two. Uh, we talked about Tim Hesse Coates writing uh, Superman. Let's hope that that project moves forward and we actually get the Superman we all want to see. Um, then, uh, then the other one, this is a really interesting one. Uh, somebody called Megascope Books is basically taking all the old Jack Kirby uh, characters and reimagining them through whether it be an African-American or, or African lens. Um, mm. So for example, they take like the Incredible Hulk and make him into the unkillable buck, right? And so they're, <laughs> they're gonna make like analogs of a bunch of the characters, but give them their own stories. They're not just gonna be like, oh, somebody trying to play in that in the same world as Hulk. They're mm. like, let's just flip them around and make give them mm. their own story, but have them be based on that character in terms of what the power is, for example, like, being like super, super strong, strong or whatever yeah or it may be uh so that's another one to look out for megascope putting out a bunch of books from that perspective and then probably the biggest one of all of these which funny enough is like i cannot believe that this this was buried so much in d in, in kind of like the disney day but disney is now partnering with a comic book company called kugali to make an animated series based on a futuristic view of not lagos but lagos Good, because good, in the future, good. we all call it Legos. Did I do good, David? <laughs> 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 Sorry, for anybody who missed that, like David, David had a very uh, a public source announcement around how to pronounce Legos, <laughs> which I think most of the people are messing up constantly. So I'm glad that someone is standing up for Legos. Uh, but uh, point being is that uh, this is a major partnership. Like this is a studio that was making graphic novels that this isn't Marvel. This isn't DC. This is a small studio in Nigeria. And the fact that they're partnering with Disney is absolutely huge. And the stories that could come off of that could truly be Afro, not Afrofuturism, but African futurism, 
mm. that we get, right? And hopefully, hopefully, some little bit of Afro Jujuism as well. And I think there could be really great potential for that. So I hope that partnership like flourishes and, and goes forward. Uh, dude, I was um, I was checking out checking out some of the art style they, they've got, like some oh, of the drawings. The art looks banging. It's sick, dude. It's that really great amazing. aesthetic. Yeah. The aesthetic is just like, there's so much more like just vibrance and color yeah. and just like, just the way that things are, are, are drawn and created, like you can tell they're rooted in a, just a different mythos, not in what we're used to in Western culture. Uh, which funny enough, uh, something I didn't touch on earlier, um, that just going back to African technology. I think you mentioned this, this comment Tom, about like, just like how we perceive African technology. Uh, Nettie Crowfoy has this really great take on it, where she's like, in one of my books, I basically uh, wrote in a TV that you just you can just roll up. You roll up the TV and you take it with you and you can just slap it on a wall anywhere. Yeah. You just roll it out and then the TV's there. And she's like, I wrote that because every time I travel to Nigeria, um, we fly into Lagos, uh, but then uh, we go to uh, the town where my family's from, which I think is, I believe it's Southeast or Southwest Nigeria. And she's like, Every time we go there, because of the flood season, the roads are horrible. It's like we're just bouncing all around the truck the whole time there. And then I get to the town that has like no real shops, and I see people with flat screen TVs hooked up to a generator. And she's like, yeah. that to me was African technology. Because it's like, it's one, how do you make it worth with little you have? But also she's like, I was blown away by the fact it's like, how are people transporting TVs with these crazy roads without them breaking and arriving mm. in, in the town in that way. She's like, yeah. so it made me think of like, they maybe just roll them up so that they don't get broken, right? It's like, that would be a natural progression of technology mm. because you're more likely to get better TVs before you get better roads. Mm. And I can <laughs> totally vouch for that in Honduras. It's like, roads were a constant topic my whole childhood mm. still are they still suck but we all have flat screen tvs now right <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so i i really love that uh, that that take on it just like how do you take the technology in in lesser developed countries and then or like it's just differently developed countries right even saying that felt wrong it's like it's just differently developed it's like you get to see a lot of the things in terms of how we pay for things, like being able to pay for stuff through Twitter, like through texts and stuff. They were paying each other through texts in India and Africa before we ever did it in the States. Like that yeah. technology was over because you didn't have access to the bank, right? So then technology takes off that way. It's an alternative. Um, it's an alternative. It's like one of my favorite stories, a, a buddy of mine went to Cuba as you imagine, like Cuba technologically wise, in terms of like what we consider useful technology is way behind, but they have way better medicine than, than us and stuff like that, right? And he says that he goes to this plaza and people are just having this party, man. Just like they're dancing, there's music going and they're like, hey, like what's going on? Like, is there like, like, a, like an event and stuff? And the guy's just like, no, I can't Wi-Fi. And it's like, <laughs> what do you mean? It's like, Wi-Fi. <laughs> And it's like, no, it's like, we got Wi-Fi here. <laughs> and they just throw this big party, right? It's like, and it's like, yeah, it's like, why wouldn't we celebrate it that way, right? It's like, it's, that, that, that's not going like, oh, bless them. Like, they, they barely get excited about Wi-Fi. No, it's just like, no, they take Wi-Fi and they create a party around it. Like, it's just yeah. a different way of interacting with technology. It's not yeah. lesser or more. It's just different. And that's the part that I love that, that, that a lot of these stories are embracing. Mm. <laughs> uh nice. So, so in terms of, of products, uh, projects being developed, uh, Nedia Korofor has two projects right now, which very nicely are with HBO and Hulu. So big players. Mm. Uh, one of her novels, Who Fears Death, is going to be developed by HBO. And that's in the works already. So I think that's coming out fairly soon. And then she's working on her Binti trilogy with Hulu, uh, which that was the one about the girl going into space uh, to, yep. to study. And then, and as I mentioned earlier, N.K. Jemison is getting the Broken Earth. Oh, sorry, I, I messed this up earlier. She, the Broken Earth trilogy is being developed by TNT, which is a little bit concerned about that. But I'll give them the benefit of that. Hopefully TNT will do a good job. Uh, and then finally, people are going back to adapt Octavia Butler's work. And this is just, I think, the beginning, because I think there's a lot more planned. Uh, Wild Seed, one of her first novels, uh, it's about two Africans that are immortal. Uh, it's being developed by Viola Davis and Nettie Korofor, which I think it would be an amazing. amazing team to develop something <laughs> like that. Um, and then uh, there's another one of her novels called Dawn. It's being developed by Amazon. And that's about rebuilding the human race inside a spaceship once you've been displaced from, 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 the, from, the, from, from Earth. Earth. 
and that's being developed by Ava DuVernay. So once again, mm-hmm. big names attached, people showing up for each other, which I'm really happy about, uh, just yeah. to help produce and elevate others around him. And that's what people like Viola Davis, DuVernay, Ryan Coogler, mm-hmm. uh, all these people, like they can help elevate others around them to, so yeah. this art can be seen. I'm really happy to see them show up. Yeah, uh, Coogler has his deal with Disney as well, doesn't he? Um, yeah. Through his production company. Yep. Uh, for multiple yeah. projects. Yes. Um, yeah. Yep. 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 So, um, and uh, and that's and that's kind of it for the future, guys. Uh, I think there's there's more projects I'm sure that are being developed that I'm not aware of, and as we talked about earlier, definitely check out like small um, uh, creators that are still dependent on Kickstarter crowdfunding and stuff like that. Definitely throw in a few bucks yeah. to catch to catch one of their novels or their series or whatever it may be. Uh, webtoons. There's a lot on web comics that's being developed in, in, in terms of like mm. that African aesthetic that I've definitely seen it flourish there quite a bit. Um, and so people are developing into like short forms of anime uh, that you can find that aren't across like all the crunchy roll and stuff like that, but you can definitely find it. So yeah. I think there's a lot of content on YouTube also if you if you care to dig into time. and spend some yeah. time. I mean, not not is not a, all of it is equally um, good Polished. in terms of, of 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 quality, but there's a lot of um, you know I always find as a good starting point to dig into something new. There's there's always a lot of good stuff out there, and it, especially on YouTube, there's always something um, good enough that is worthy of your time. Woo. And there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and a good way of like dipping your toe into it. Uh, I, I think that's the, the last thing I have on the dock here is like, uh, check out LeVar Burton Reads. LeVar Burton is the, is the, is the man that played Jordy. Yeah, and and, and um, Star Trek: The Next Generation, sorry, Jordy, and then Star Trek: The Next Generation, and he has this uh, podcast where he just reads short stories. Go in there and just check out anything by Nettie Korafor, N.K. Jemisin, or Octavia Butler. He's got a few of them sprinkled throughout. And it takes about 40 minutes to like listen to for short stories and you'll understand what, what African futurism means. Like, it'll be very easy to pick up. Like if it's something that you want to roll with or not, I, I'd be surprised if anything were interested in these stories. They're all great. They, they, they're just such different takes on things that we're used to seeing through just one lens that has been the same lens for years and years. It's just different takes on it. And it's super fascinating. So that's a good way of just dipping your toe if you want to make too much of an investment. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely go check out Liv about Burton. I think it's quite yeah. cool. I like somebody else reading books to me. <laughs> reading the stories. I love to use my eyes. Whew, right. Um, so what do you think, fellas? You want- yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's, it's super interesting. There's there's a lot of good recommendations at the end in, in the future part. I think it's... Uh, I, I got to go back and get myself into Lovecraft country there because you've been talking about it for so long. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. definitely need to go in there. Um, yeah. It's, oh, it's and, exciting. And, this is, yep. Oh, Watchmen season two is a possibility as well. All right. Yeah, no, I didn't see anything being confirmed yet. So Yeah, nothing confirmed, but they're definitely actively discussing it. Yeah. yeah. Now, there's a lot of good stuff in there. It's really interesting. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the future is bright. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tom, it's black. Exactly. <laughs> I was waiting. I was hoping someone would pick up on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. All right. Um, yeah. So, and uh, I think as a, as a conclusion um, for me, I mean, I, th- I think there's there's a lot of it. I mean, we, we we did cover a bunch of topics that are quite heavy, you know, or at least uh, mention them. You know, like you know, obviously there's slavery and there's a lot of. Um, things that happened in the past are very heavy to to digest and, and analyze and it's um i understand well it's it's very uncomfortable for a lot of people and it's, and it's very um it, it is a very touchy subject right to to sort of go back into the past and, and understand try and understand where what happened and, and and where it's all going and you know it's it's very um it's very um you know touchy. sensitive it's sensitive yeah um so i understand there's people that maybe are not ready to listen and uh and make the jump really but once you've um sort of broadened your your horizon and, and your mind a little bit and you start understanding what happened and what's going on now it's it's it is a massive wealth of thing that you can discover and, and and enjoy um and and none of it is high quality content that is being produced from from um out of africa and um, and and it's not because it's different to your you know our own culture your you know our own personal cultures that we should just 
ignore it outright. I think it's quite the opposite. It should be embraced. So I hope everyone's enjoyed at least our four episodes of recommendations and this special on Afrofuturism. I think I've, I've enjoyed it a lot because this, are, this is something I'm, I'm still discovering. It's not something I was really, um, uh, well, I wasn't brought up into it at all. Um, and th- there's so much content, there's so much more that, that, that I'm sure will come out of this um, that I'm very much looking forward to discover a lot more, you know, about, about what Africa in terms of culturally has to offer and um, creatively in that. I think it's exciting. It's very exciting to know that, to see that. Um, but yeah, that's my sort of final take on it. I don't know if you guys have anything else to add. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that is what should be taken from it, that it's an opportunity to hear from, see, consume Mm -hmm. new ideas from uh, uh, an area of the world and areas of the world or people in areas of the world that haven't been able to express themselves on, on such a large scale. And it's, it's just that it's an opportunity to see new things, new, exciting and enjoyable things. Um, that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. It's, it's all positive as far as I'm concerned. Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's probably what I, where I would leave it on that. Uh, I think uh, I like your approach, Tom, that you're very much coming at it from a p- perspective of curiosity. Um, and I think that a lot of times like people can can be asked to get into this. Uh, I, I noticed a lot of people during the right after George Floyd incident happened. And as, as, as BLM really t- kind of took hold, I saw a lot of posts and a lot of people going like, I'm going to pick up this Afrofuturistic book. I'm going to pick up that Afrofuturistic book and read it. I'm like, okay, good, 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 good. But there's no need to come at it this from a point of like, uh, shame, responsibility, that I was sort of like, okay, if you're going to do that, go, go, go read history. But like come at it from just from a point of curiosity of just a fan, because all this stuff is great. Even the stuff that isn't great, there's something to appreciate. In. And as with all art and there's a, and most of it is great, is a great yeah. part. So that to me is like the main thing I want to leave everyone with, which is like, just, just lean into your curiosity and let go of your biases and just like sit in for a great story because all of these are great stories. Indeed. Indeed. All right. Then I think we should leave it there. Um, Dave, thanks again for joining us. Um, we, we'll see you one more time <laughs> in another episode. Um, oh, would, yeah. you, would you care to plug your other podcast again? Uh, yes. Uh, so me and Tom are part of the Grit and Grind Basketball Podcast. We mostly podcast about the NBA, um, but we tend to have guests from the UK. Um, recently, we had Denzel Ubiaro, who plays for the Plymouth Raiders. Um, and he came in, spoke a bit about his story um, and life as a as a pro in the UK, which was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, okay. And then thank you, JC, again for all the research on this one. Um, greatly appreciated. You taught me some stuff, a lot of stuff. So it's quite it's quite interesting. Um, I think we should leave it there. I want to say thanks to everyone who subscribed. If you've not subscribed just yet on any platform you are listening us to right now, if it is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or I don't know, YouTube, for example, um, make sure you subscribe and like us and share us with your friends, with your family. And we'll be back. Thank- oh, yeah. Thanks to all the uh, the thousand people on Instagram that, that subscribed to our account. It's crazy. I think we... We got up 1,026 as of today. Um, uh, we appreciate your support and the messages we get also. There's a lot of interaction going on there. It's quite fun. Uh, and also the 300 and something on Twitter that have uh, <laughs> decided to follow us in the last couple of days. It's quite interesting. Um, that's it. So if you could uh, subscribe, like and share, like I mentioned before, we'll catch you in another episode. We'll catch you some some more marvel content uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we catch you guys in another episode thanks for listening and we'll see you all later <laughs> Wakanda forever <laughs> <laughs>